Is this better? Talk louder. Talk louder. I'll talk louder. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you all for coming today. This is wonderful. Um, just amazing to have all these people here. And I want to thank the uh, Bristol Hills Historical Society for using our center on the hill, our community center, which to a lot of you may be different. I never heard of center on the hill, a community center. But about, um, well, just before COVID, our church decided that we wanted to open our facilities so that uh, community, which we are only like 15 minutes from Canada, we're from Bristol, from Honey Eye, Bloomfield, uh, Naples. So we wanted to open our building up so that everyone in the community would have use of this facility. Because sometimes you don't have the room. For example, today is a good example. Um, and sometimes you just don't have the money to rent a hall. So um, we created Center on the Hill, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. It has, obviously, we have a great big hall here. We can use our sanctuary for presentations such as this. Um, and when you came in, well, a lot of you came in that way, but in up above that little entrance way up there, there's a classroom. That's, it's my favorite one because it has the stained glass windows. Um, it's a small classroom, but it's great for us. We had a book talk, we had Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. It's a little room, wonderful. Um, then behind me, there's a social hall that runs from that end all the way down there, which is great for if you want to do a fundraiser. There's um, two handicapped bathrooms off of it. There's a handicapped um, ramp that leads right into the social hall, so you don't have to truck through the kitchen or the uh, sanctuary here to get to the social hall. Um, and the social hall could be divided into three smaller rooms if needed. Um, by, we have five folds. Next to the social hall is the kitchen. It's quite a large kitchen. Two stoves, two ovens, uh, freezer, refrigerator, three um, sinks, all the dishes you need, silverware, utensils, um, it's all there. And then upstairs there is a nursery which is brand new. All the, pretty much the toys from, they're from the nursery all the way up through 12, about 12 years of age. There's also a changing table up there and a place to, you know, lay a baby down so they can get some sleep. Um, and then adjoining that, there is a, um, another classroom. It's quite large. Doesn't have carpet, so if you want to do anything with crafts, it's messy, great place to go. And also exercising, it, um, it lends itself very well to that. Uh, and then we have the Bears Playground outside, which is, I don't think it's about maybe three years old. And we have another older playground, which is, um, we have a Boy Scout who, in the month of April, is going to renovate it. He's going to add to that playground so that the top story is more accessible to young children. And we're also becoming a little bit inclusive in that he's um, putting up a swing with a um, concrete pad to get to that swing. So we're, we're starting in that direction too. Um, parking lot, huge parking lot. And if you wanted to do something outside, we, it's beautifully shaded out on the side of our church. You also could use the side if you wanted to. Um, so it's, it's a great facility. And the best thing of all, all that I talked about is free. Uh, it's all free to the community. We want to give people in our community a place to come. Uh, if you have an organization you need a facility, it's here. Um, or a family, your house is too small, bring them in. Uh, we'll be glad to have them come. We um, have a Facebook page, we're on email, and we have a phone number. And there is a little pamphlet on the uh, side of each pew that gives you that information as far as how to reach us. Um, there's more pamphlets out um, just as you come out in the social hall, which will be going out there later for uh, cookies and beverages. Um, so uh, take those with you if you have questions. I will be available for any questions or give you a tour. If you want to know more about the facility, I'd be glad to do that. Um, I also should probably take this opportunity to tell you about two um, events we have coming. Next Friday, we have a game night. 
um, I need three more people to play euchre with. And uh, <coughs> bring your own game. We have games here. We're going to have a little snack. Uh, it's just going to be a fun time to be together with your family, your friends. You're all welcome. We've got a lot of room out there, and we'll have a good time. Our big event um, is coming in March. It's March 11th. It's the Winter Blas Dinner. We're all sick of the gray. Um, and it's a fundraiser for the, um, uh, it's the hospice in, in Canandaigua. And I forgot the first part of it. Glide Hill. Glide Hill. Thank you very much. Um, so we want to do something community. We decided on that would be where we would um, raise funds for this time. Um, the meal is fettuccine Alfredo. And Bob Green, I saw him here someplace. He's going to be um, him. He will be on keyboard. Tim Hamlin will be on the guitar. And Mary uh, and Stress, Mary Lynn, Mary, Mary, yeah, Mary, Mary Stress, Stress will be here. She is the voice of an angel. So they will be providing the environment you want. But we're also transforming the social hall into spring. We'll have. Real grass, I hope, if I get it growing, flowers, real flowers, and of course other decorations that, um, it's just going to be a beautiful, beautiful evening. So, uh, and you can make reservations. There's um, brochures out there, flyers, grab them, it tells you who you can contact and you can make a reservation. You don't need to. I mean, you can just walk in. So, um, those are two things we have coming. Um, so, we hope you'll come again and enjoy our center on the hill. So with that I want to introduce to you someone probably a lot of you know, John Holtz. He is on the board of Bristol Hills Historical Society. And so John, you're on. Okay. I was told to make this quick because sometimes I get long-winded. So I'll do my best. Um, for those of you who have been around for a while. This is, I think, our third collaboration with the DEC. Um, back in the early 2000s, we did one in Honeyoy at the UCC Church when black bears just started coming back into the area. And we did something. We had a speaker from Ganondagan to talk, come down and talk about how the Seneca is related to bears. And we had the DEC talk about you know, how we relate to bears today and what was going on with this migration to our area. Um, and then in uh, South Bristol's 175th anniversary, we had a DEC agent posted at Stid Hill uh, during our tour of the town uh, that day to talk about you know, available resources in our area uh, that are managed by the DEC. So no, and we've so we've had a pretty good track record of well well attended events when we collaborate with the DEC, and so um, I didn't plan on collaborating with the DEC this year, but we had a, uh, I was working on another event which hopefully we'll have done in the future on the history of music from this area and the different bands through the years and what influenced mm -hmm. the music, uh, but the person I had lined up to do that ended up having a conflict. And I just found out, I don't know, two months ago that he wasn't able to do the program. And so I, um, I scrambled to plan B, or plan D, E, C, and uh, <laughs> went and talked to them. And someone there, I don't know if a higher up or whatever, forced uh, Mike to come here <laughs> and do this community outreach. And so we're grateful that he did, and he was willing to go ahead and do it. Um, I was first, I thought, how am I going to attract a crowd? I'm going to have to come up with a sexy topic. And I thought, predators are coming back to the Bristol Hills. You know, we've got bobcats and coyotes now, or wolves and you know, then, then I was told to calm down. <laughs> and, you know, why don't we do something? And it was suggested by our uh, public relations person, Mark Obi, he said, why don't we relate it to our mission? Oh, that's a good idea. And so I guess you're going to talk a little bit about the history and the, uh, things have evolved and moved, you know, how the environment's changed and what's changed with it and what influences what. I believe that's what we're doing. Okay. 
but um, I just I'll go through this real quick. We do have a sign-up sheet going around. I don't know if it's still going around. Um, I think there's only room for like 50 names on there. I, I don't know if we have more than 50 groups of people. <laughs> it's not something to be afraid of. We are not going to hit you up with junk. Um, but you um, will get notices about events that we have coming up. And we've got a little checkbox if you're interested in membership or if you're interested in uh, purchasing the book we have coming up. And uh, if you've seen me talk before, it's probably been about the book that we have coming out on the history and mystery, the folklore and legends of the Bristol Hills. And that's, uh, we've got about close to, I think, 28 or 29 stories plus a map I think we come up with. 30 original illustrations with narratives who accompany the illustration about um, stories that have been passed down through the years. And um, I think it should be highly interest interesting. I don't know about another historical society that has approached the, the story of their town in this manner. So uh, we're hoping it'll be successful. Um, we're having 200 copies printed. Uh, at least as we're talking about now, when we have over 70 already pre-ordered. So um, if you're interested and you want to make sure you don't miss out on this heirloom keepsake, <laughs> which we hope it'll be, um, you can purchase that book today, advanced purchase. And we're going to have a man, uh, Mark Obi, will be here with his um, device to take your money out of your credit card to do that. We also, uh, because we do need money to function, um, we are selling some t-shirts uh, for $15. Mark will be able to do that. Mark will be able to sign you up for a membership. Uh, and he'll be in the back room after the talk. And in the back room after the talk, we have some cookies and, and coffee and stuff if you want to linger and chat with anybody or ask some more questions you're embarrassed to ask in front of everybody. You can ask him afterwards. Um, let me see if you want to list your search. Um, speaking of, if you're on that email list, we, our next talk coming up is going to be at the end of April, I believe, I believe it's April 29th, down at our building in Bristol Springs. We're going to have Dr. Bruce Gilman give the third part of his trilogy, on, um, and this one is going to be about the wildflowers or the flora of the Ontario and the Bristol Hills. And it'll culminate, we had one on how the Bristol Hills came to be due to the glaciers. <laughs> The soil conditions that, uh, that that came about because of the glaciation and everything, and how that's and now what's springing out of the soil is going to be in the, the plants and flowers. So that should be real. Those are always really well attended. And in May, uh, we, we have some events coming up. May is when we're going to have the book release event at um, at our building in Bristol Springs. The artist will be there. There'll be displays of the paintings. It should be a, a lot of fun. We are negotiating right now to get a Seneca storyteller to talk about some of the legends from this area before we unveil the book. The artist will be there to sign copies. Um, in in uh, May also is the first of the two Burning Springs garden tours and Burning Springs tour. Uh, if you've never done that, that's a lot of fun. And then we're also in collaboration with uh, Cummings Nature Center and several archaeological societies. There's going to be an archaeological symposium that's going to take place at Cummings Nature Center, which we're going to be a part of. And uh, for those of you who know what we did last year, there's an archaeological dig going on at Burning Springs. There's one on an 1800 schoolhouse going on in South Bristol. There's an 1818 mill site in, uh, in South Bristol that's due to be um, looked at by the archaeological society. And there's a whole bunch of, of stuff going on and for this little area, which is kind of like um, trapped in a time warp some, in some ways. There, we're still, the 1800s are still accessible here, which they aren't in a lot of other areas. And these archaeologists are helping us discover that. And so um, before I turn it over, I like to say something profound. And, uh, and I can't say it, so I, I, I cheat and read what somebody else wrote. And this is what Thoreau wrote about uh, this, and he wrote, not about this, but what Thoreau wrote. He says, wherever men have, have lived, there is a story to be told, 
and it depends chiefly on the storyteller or historian whether that is interesting or not. And we're trying our best to make things interesting. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Well, I certainly will try to make this interesting. Uh, there is a story to be told. Thank you for that introduction, and I'm just blown away by this attendance. Way bigger than I expected. I hope to make this, you know, informative and entertaining. Uh, let me just introduce myself one more time. I'm Mike Palermo with the New York State DEC. I'm a wildlife biologist there, um, stationed in the Avon office, so not very far from here. I've been a biologist there for about eight years now, and my primary focus is forest habitats and you know, the health of those, how good quality of those, what are problems, ways we can fix it, and how that relates to wildlife. Because really, we, we care about wildlife, the birds, the mammals, and all that, but a lot of their well-being is based upon them having good quality habitat. So a lot of today's talk is going to be interlinking the habitat, how that's changed, and how that's affected wildlife in this area over time, and where we are now. Uh, Beth here is going to be helping me advancing these slides. So I apologize that you know this may not be perfect setup to give you know these photos and, and let you see how things look, but we'll do the best we can. But the content is what matters, right? So I'll I'll keep things interesting. This was just a photo I wanted to start with of the Bristol Hills, right? This is from Stid Hill, some state land. Uh, just looking across the valley, you know, Route 64 is just kind of running through the center there and we've got these big beautiful hills. Like it's such a spectacular area here. Uh, you can hit next, please. So this is just an outline of, of what I'm going to discuss. You know, those letters are cut off, it doesn't matter. I'm going to start with the habitat, like I said. Discussing the changes over time. And where I'm beginning is with, you know, the beginning of, of the significant changes that follow European settlement. So in this area, we're looking at like 1780s-ish is the time frame that I'm going to begin talking about how things have changed. And then I'll get into how that actually affected wildlife populations. The other things that were influencing those wildlife populations, like hunting and trapping at that time, um, which was without limit, it was pretty intense. And then, since I'm with DEC, I'm a conservationist, I have to touch upon the current issues and threats and, and how that will influence the future of the Bristol Hills, right? So this will not always be the present, some days will be our history. So I want to touch on that and then give some ideas about how all of you can make a difference with that as well. Next, please. So just a map to kind of identify the location that we're talking about. I'm sure you all know about it. Except maybe some people drove from far away and just thought it sounded cool. But the Bristol Hills generally is this area between Honeyway Lake and Canandaigua Lake. You know, I had a hard time online trying to find a delineated boundary for that. You know, maybe it's what's in the towns of Bristol and South Bristol. But I think it's just this, this geologic area of these hills between there. And especially how that relates to the, the cover, the habitat, and the wildlife. That's really where they're... You know, it's very similar in between there. So you can hit next, please. So this map just shows the actual cover that we have there now. So this is from the, the federal government's uh, US Geologic Survey puts out a, a national land cover data set. And so basically, our whole landscape is turned into these tiny little pixels and they assign it a, a number that says, this is forest, this is farmland, whatever. So with this, you can see all that brown, that's all of our, our agriculture that you know, was really amazing in this part of the state. You get down to this area where the Bristol Hills are, it's almost solid green. So it's lots and lots of forest. And then this swath of forest that kind of goes along this part of the Western Finger Lakes is really surrounded by this patchwork of, of farmland and fragmented forest. So this is really important to wildlife, this area. Next, please. So getting to the starting point of what I'm going to talk about, kind of just paint you a picture of what the forest habitat looked like to begin with and what wildlife we're utilizing. Uh, so sure, there's been human influence on, on that composition for a long time. You know, indigenous peoples have been here for close to 13,000 years, and, and they did have a relationship with the land that, that manipulated it you know, somewhat. They had their villages where they lived, they grew some crops, they burned in some areas. Um, but that's not the big change I'm here to talk about. It's what happened after that. And that time frame of like 1780 or so, this part of New York at least was extremely forested. Uh, most of New York was very forested to begin with, 
European settlement started at different time frames. You know, obviously downstate much sooner than up here. But about 80 to 90 percent of the state was forested then. Probably this part of the state, Bristol Hills, was probably closer to that 90 percent. You know, areas that were there were some wetlands that were probably open. The lakes obviously were open, and some of those fields and areas that were burned were probably open. Most of this was forest. Could you get the next, please? And a lot of it probably looked somewhat like this, where it was, you know, a mature forest with a canopy spreading for miles. Uh, you know, the understory here of this example photo, I had big logs piled up decaying. But there's this arrangement. There's just a lot of different sizes of trees. Even though the forest was very old, probably didn't see a lot of, you know, um, reoccurring clearing or fires like that the natives did, there was still plenty of disturbance. You know, there were big storms that would hit it. There were beavers that would eat out a whole area, flood it, and then that would be abandoned and new areas would regrow. Um, big floods and valleys, different sort of insect outbreaks, things would cause um, this diversity of tree ages. So you would have big trees for sure, but there were a lot of these smaller and medium sized trees. You could hit next, please. And so this is just a photo from some state land that we actually have in Genesee County that I feel is a decent representation of what some more of it might have looked like with species composition. Back then, we probably had a lot more hemlock and beech. It's really cool, there's records of old surveys of land, lot lines, and this and that, and they use trees as, as the witnesses of marking certain corners or, or boundaries. And, and there's some literature out there that will show you, you know, general areas where they have reliable data of what the starting point kind of looked like. And there's surprisingly a few blobs right in our part of the state. And at that time, you know, we had still a lot of oak then as we do now. Um, there was a decent amount of chestnut here, but there was more hemlock um, and beech as well. So this image, it's, it's hard to see, I know, but big trees, medium trees, spread out, if you can hit next. Surely there were some, okay, so this is talking about the habitat kind of component there. The wildlife was utilizing these layers, that the forest wasn't just, you know, a, a canopy and, and a forest floor. There was a lot of structure in there, decaying old trees, big trees, little trees here and there, and a lot of wildlife evolved to need that, and, and that can take hundreds of years to develop. You know, the normal kind of fire interval around here was generally several hundred years, unless it was intentionally set. So a lot of forests got to build up this material. Hit next, please. And so just to kind of pay homage to the giant trees that were here, there was some really cool stuff, and you can read old documents about, you know, six foot across oak trees just you know scattered here and there but it wasn't like if you went to the redwoods out west where all the trees are just massive and and that's all you're seeing it was like i was saying this diversity of of constantly these disturbances coming regrowing certain areas with big trees that managed to survive and last for hundreds of years and then next to address the wildlife at that time you know what, what we know were here around that time 1780 or so this image, this photo, I actually took just the other day at Cumming Nature Center. Super awesome place if you haven't been there, highly recommend it. But it's nice they have these cool displays. And it just kind of has some of the characteristic ones right there. We had plenty of wolves, we had elk, mountain lion, bobcat. Moose, probably not as much in this part of the state at that time. Uh, there were plenty of moose up in the North Country, Adirondack area, probably some you know, on the, the plains south of Lake Ontario. Uh, but this part, they, they just, like to be in, in different types of forest. Surely they were around Bristol Hills in the past thousands of years, but not as much around them. But some of the other ones listed there that I'm going to touch on all these in more detail later in the uh, presentation, but Fisher, Beaver, Turkey, Black Bear, yeah, there were plenty of these. Get next, please. But all that really changed quickly after European settlement. And to start with the discussion, how that affected the primary habitat, the forest, and then how that relates to the wildlife. I'm going to try and get these numbers right, these dates, as best I can with how they're kind of skewed there. But so around 1779 is is uh, you know a, a event that began that European settlement. Um, I'm not going to get into much detail here about General Sullivan's campaign. It could be a whole discussion another time. But during the Revolutionary War, Washington sent Sullivan up here with several thousand troops. And they cleared the area of a lot of the native peoples and then opened it up to European <coughs> settlement. Revolutionary War ended, 
1783, and that's when a lot of that began. You can see the, this illustration on the right. It just shows kind of a homestead popping up. Clearing some trees, building a cabin, making some space. If you could hit next, please. That intensifies, you know, more clearing, um, getting into, they need wood to burn, wood to you know, build things, and, and wood to export and, and make money off of. So it, it intensified. The town of Bristol was established, 1789 there. So that's really the beginning of it. Um, and then in like seven, 1790s, I had a hard time being positive what would be the first time a sawmill popped up as close to here as possible, but around 1790s uh, that that really happened and that really you know expedites the ability to cut trees, turn them into usable goods, and move them around. Um, back then, sawmills were water-powered, built on some sort of a you know stream, and, and so they had limitations, but it really helped get things moving. So if you could hit next, please, another new image. It transitioned not only to consuming forest goods and, and creating lumber and, and selling lumber, but to clearing the land to create crops and agriculture. Things to sustain people off of, things to export down to urban areas to, um, you know, for economy and to feed other people. So trees were totally eliminated, stumps were removed, they used, you know, horses and other livestock to move things, they burned all the slash they didn't need, and that's why that 80 to 90 percent now is a lot of the fields that you can see these days. And, and next, I just thought this was a cool photo. It might not show very well, but it's this big device with ropes and horses that are pulling the stumps out. It was kind of cool to really see that represented. Next, please. So <clears throat> that continued. It progressed and, and increased until about 1880. That was really kind of the, the climax of that land clearing period where when New York State used to be 90% forest, it dropped down to 25%. So huge difference, right? That's, that's millions of acres. It's like 25 million acres that went from forest to non-forest. And a lot of that was, was progressed through technological advances, making it easier. Um, you know, this photo here is just showing how sawmills changed, that previously it was you know, limited to um, on those streams. The blades were a lot more simple as they were able to create more steel components, they could make circular saws, they were able to pump out way more lumber, faster, better quality. Uh, so that sped some of that up. Uh, next photo, please. And then introduction of rail, you know, mid 1800s or so, linking up railroads across the state to other states, being able to just put up temporary rail lines to get into the hard to access parts of forests and get that out of there. Uh, there's a, a place that maybe you're familiar with, south end of Honeyway Lake, Briggs Gully. Uh, part of that's owned by the Finger Lakes Land Trust, Wesley Hill Preserve. There's photos of an old little rail line going through that gully to get trees off from the top and down to the bottom of the valley there. There's no signs of it now, but it's just insane that that ever really happened. So that really helped them log in places that were really hard to get to. Um, next, please. And, and so this is a drawing showing uh, people stripping bark off of hemlock trees. So nothing really was unutilized. There was a purpose and a need for almost everything. So a lot of this in the beginning, you know, they went after what was most valuable at the time, white pine, white oak, really great for, for their lumber purposes, for making masts on ships and things like that. But then later on, you know, the hemlock was, was kind of ignored that first time around. And then secondly, secondly, they realized that hemlock bark is really good for tanning leather. And there was just a huge leather business in the mid to late 1800s. So they went after the hemlock then, peeled that off and they could process it. Chemical wood is one I have listed there that I never knew about. That is just amazing to think that, you know, in the late 1800s, they really utilized all the wood that they could turn it into charcoal, which was really important for, you know, um, smelting of steel and other metal products, that it's just a better consistent high heat that can be used for that. They made methanol um, and acetate of lime. Don't really know what that's for, but all these really cool things that you wouldn't think chemicals <laughs> coming out of wood that could be used. So they didn't leave really much behind. They took everything and they utilized it. Um, so this changes in technology is what drove this clear cutting era and, and the land clearing era. Uh, but technology is also what 
kind of slowed it down. And, and so about the 1920s, really the development of you know, the petrochemical industry and oil and gas made the dependency and need for a lot of these wood products less. Um, so that's when you see the transition on the next slide, um, where we're going to start talking about reforestation. A lot of that ties in um, to when a lot of the forests were then kind of let go. Um, they either didn't need the resources anymore or the resources were exhausted, basically, and, and then they were allowed to reforest. And so we're, we're going to kind of dial back a little bit back to after the Civil War. So I had gotten myself into the 20s there already. But this abandonment of, of farmland started that early. And so there was a lot of it going on at the same time that they cleared the land in the early 1800s, found that it was not productive, soil was really poor, or after the Civil War, people just wanted to move out west because they could get to Minnesota and Wisconsin, Iowa, and farm there instead. And so a lot of that was starting to be abandoned, turning into forest. Still, while they were logging a lot of those other harder places that couldn't be turned into farmland. Um, and, and so that progressed until about 1930, where that was really kind of the climax and, and peak of accelerating reforestation. So a lot of those farms were abandoned uh, because they were infertile after the stock market crash in the 20, 20s. Again, a lot of different farm owners were just unable to sustain themselves with, with, without productive crops coming in. Um, and then the CCC was established, a Civilian Conservation Corps. So that was a government program created during the New Deal and employed, it was three million people over the course of nine years, and they planted three and a half billion trees. So that contributed to a huge amount of the reforestation. A lot of it was just abandoning farmland, but a lot of it was what you can see down here, which the image is going to be hard right now, but it's an old photo from the 30s of a group of men just planting trees in an old field. And a lot of those fields had really poor soil, should never have been deforested to begin with, and that makes the soil even worse from erosion and things like that. So they were planting a lot of trees. And then just at the top there, it's just kind of showing what um, an abandoned field starts to look like. It doesn't take very long if you have the seed source for plants, woody plants to start growing shrubs and trees, which over time turn into a forest. And so that, that term is called ecological succession of, of plants becoming more complex over time. And where we live, just with our climate and temperate um, moisture, all that, it allows trees to grow. So, that, so all that really happening by the 40s even, the southern tier part of New York had, had dramatically increased from forest. You know, 25% to who knows what percent, but starkly more. Can you get next, please? And then another thing happened in the mix of all this, the American chestnut. I'm sure everyone's kind of familiar with that term. Chestnut is a tree, it's a nut we like to eat. It was a native tree here that was uh, a dominant component of our forests. Looking back at some of that data that I had mentioned about you know, those witness trees on old surveys, chestnut was, you know, in this part of the area, probably about 10 to 20% of the forest. Uh, but in the early 1900s, by accident, we brought a uh, disease over from you know, just international mixing and trade, uh, a fungus that attacked the American chestnut trees and killed them pretty quickly and, and essentially wiped them out. You, know, you can still find some of them on the landscape, but they're not very functional anymore. They grow to you know, 10, 20 feet. They remain kind of shrubby and then, then that disease, the fungus blight, attacks them and then they start again from their roots. So luckily the roots persist. Uh, but so that was another kind of hit to the forests that were around at that time. Now we have a new hole in the forest, and that allowed even more oaks to take over, and a lot of the maples. You know, we have more red maple now than we ever did back then, and this is part of it as they filled in the gap. So next, please. So just some illustrations that really sum up everything I just said about how that forest cover changed over time. Um, you know, on the left side of that is the 1600s, so that's really early. Um, but then, right at that big dip, the bottom of that dip is about 1880, like I said, when we drop down to like 25% of forest, and then it starts to go back up. And then at the 1930s is where it really kind of sh more sharply starts picking itself up. And then the other chart on the op other side is the opposite. It's farmland increasing, peaking around 1880, and then slowly declining to, you know, it doesn't quite show present day on there, but you can see that it's just dropping as that forest is going up. So next. 
Um, please. And so that just says that by about 1993, we reached a point where you know forest wasn't as quickly growing, and we kind of reached a kind of a steady state. And that was at about 62 percent of the state then. So we went from 80 to 90 percent somewhere. You know, we don't know for sure. Down to 25 percent, and then boom, at least we got ourselves back up to 62 percent. That's pretty huge. Uh, next. So where we're at right now, we're at about 63 percent. Um, you know, it fluctuates every you know so often. You know, some places get turned into housing developments, and other farms do still get abandoned occasionally here and there. But we're we're kind of pretty steady at that 63 percent, and that totals almost 19 million acres. So that's pretty huge. And this map probably not great for you guys right now with colors. Don't worry about it at all. But it. It's just showing the current distribution of forest types in New York. So if you're seeing light tan, the gray is probably not showing up, but light tan is the agriculture, open landscape, not forest. Gray is urban areas, developed areas. But these other colors, like there's an orange there, so hopefully that's not confusing too many people, the gray or the tan between the orange. But all the green forest, tons up in the Adirondacks, tons down Allegheny area, southern tier into the Catskills. And then that big blob of orange, that's pushing its way up towards Canandaigua Lake and the Bristol Hills there is all of our oak forest. We have an you know, enormous amount of oak forest in this part of New York State. Next. And so this is kind of a glimpse of what the forest is like now. You know, most of the Bristol Hills, you take a drive, you see it, it's woods that looks like this. Um, you know, decently old trees in a lot of cases, you know, they recovered from uh, the logging era, uh, whether it be, you know, farmland that had been abandoned 100 plus years ago, or the logging that ended around then. But there's some pretty big trees, you know, some of them around 100 years old. Um, in a lot of cases, a lot of them are like this, where they're similar age. It's not like the beginning photos that I was showing you, where that forest had those layers of small trees, medium trees, big trees spread out. A lot of our forests are even age like this, because they all started growing at the same time. So it's going to take another 100 years for that to change um, on its own, but, but we're getting there. I wanted to show this one, because um, this is a mostly oak forest, this really doesn't show it now, there's a lot of red oak in there, but what's really cool about the Bristol Hills is there's a, a, an occurrence, it's just a way that we explain you know, the presence of something, of an Appalachian oak hickory forest. So that's just a type of forest that has been categorized based upon the types of trees and shrubs and other flora that are there. Um, Bruce could tell you way more about it than I could, I'm sure. He's back there, but you'll be good to hear his flora talk in April. But uh, it's really cool because the New York Natural Heritage Program, which is um, kind of DEC, but not quite. It's, a, it's part of the state government, but in a different way. They keep track of the endangered species, threatened species, rare species in New York State, and also um, rare or significant plant communities. And so this one is one that they're just like, it's such high quality, so you know special, they keep tabs on it to learn from it. Um, that we have, they have it mapped 13,000 acres in the Bristol Hills, the Bristol Hills Appalachian Oak Hickory Forest Occurrence. So that's something special. Not something to scare you out there. It's not a regulatory you know, thing. You're not going to need a permit to do anything you want in there like you might if it were you know, regulated wetland. But if, if you won't land here and, and it overlaps where this is, it's something to be proud of. It's a really, really cool forest that you've got there. Uh, and you can look it up, the DEC has an environmental resource mapper on our website where you can bring up different layers of where wetlands are and this and that. You can see where this community is. It's really, really cool. Um, so next. So I wanted to show this one because even though most of our forests are recovering from you know, this significant disturbance back in the day, there's still some pretty cool monsters out there. So this is a photo of me and, and my daughter. I'm trying to get her pretty crazy about nature as well, hugging this giant red oak. So you can find them out there, they're pretty cool. Um, it's still surprising that uh, there's trees out there. There's not many and widespread that are two, three hundred years old if you find them in the right place. So it can be really shocking. And, and even some trees that aren't that big can be pretty old. I, I had some trees cut on my property um, to try and make the habitat better intentionally to create that structure and layers and make space. And I counted some of the rings on them and there's a 180 year old hickory. It's like, how did that happen? You know, I'm surrounded by farmland, so, so for that to be spared is wild. Um, luckily, there's a lot similar trees that didn't get cut, so I didn't feel bad. Um, it'll be a great rotting habitat. So next, please. And just to kind of acknowledge, we have hemlock forest in Bristol Hills as well. You know, a lot of that's near our gullies. 
um, on some of the you know, northern facing slopes. Really awesome native tree. You know, definitely got utilized for the tanning process before, but it's hanging on. Uh, it's a very slow growing tree. It's what we call late successional. So it, it disperses slowly, it grows slowly, it grows in deep shade. So it grows after a lot of those early trees grow. Um, so there's still hemlock spreading in parts of the area. Next. And then we also have plenty of smaller trees like this. So this is what a lot of us refer to as pioneer forest, uh, composed of things like aspen, or a lot of the you know, ash trees, walnut trees. And so fields that were abandoned you know, more recently, like in the last 50 years, are gonna look more like this. And we have plenty of that. You know, maybe not on the steep slopes, because those are a little older, the top slopes may be older, but there's some areas lower down in the Bristol Hills that might have been abandoned you know, more recently, more productive. They're going to be looking like this. So next. And how you can really tell the history of, of the forest when you're out there, because sometimes these forests, you know, they're over 100 years old since they last got logged, and they might look really nice, and you would never believe that they got cleared. So you look for some evidence out there. You're going to find rock piles, um, rock walls. You know, rock walls are more often out in different parts of the state, New England, but I've seen rock walls in the Bristol Hills. And then really cool on the left there, it's actually a row of stumps, a stump fence. And I, I'd, I've seen those in the forest still in Livingston County on some state land. And it always kind of blew my mind. I, like, I never knew they would do this. And, and then I read that chestnut, what we talked about that disappeared before that blight, they probably made at least the stump fences that I saw out of chestnut because it's extremely rock resistant. So I was like, okay, that's why it's still there 100 years later. So that's really neat. So if you see these things out there, think to yourself, okay, this forest has a history. And, and, and if it looks good and healthy, that's a really good thing that it, it, it managed to recover. Next, please. And then just the, the last kind of forest to touch on uh, that you can tell the history is a plantation like this. So. During the CCC era, they planted a lot of conifers, red pine, Norway spruce, even before them and since then. So if you've got a forest like this where everything's in rows, that's been planted by somebody. And it was probably a field that was abandoned before that. Next, please. So now I transition into the wildlife side of the talk. Um, don't worry, I will talk about wolves and mountain lions. <laughs> I'm sure that's why some people are here. Uh, but I really wanted to open it with that change in habitat so that it can translate and make sense to the differences in what happened to all these different species that I'm going to highlight. So next, please. So this is just a quick background of, of some of those rules and laws that we have today that really regulate what we do to make sure that wildlife populations and when we do take from them and harvest them, it's done sustainably. Very few rules existed in the past, and, and before 1800s there were hardly any except some local laws here or there to try and maintain deer because people wanted to use the deer, it's a great resource, um, but that hardly ever really touched on numbers they could take. It was more just not during this you know, time of year. So it wasn't really until 1788 you saw a more comprehensive statewide law come and that was, again, dealing with deer and close the season, but just a time frame again, between January to July. It didn't address the fact that maybe you shouldn't shoot 15 of them. Um, so around 1880 is when that really got structured. And we actually had um, a government body in place that could be um, able to enforce those laws, because that was part of the problem. It's laws on the books doesn't matter if no one's there to catch somebody and, and you make them accountable for it. So our first fish and game protectors were employed by New York State. That's actually before they even hired state troopers, which is kind of cool. Um, and then it was in 1892 that they finally established some real strong laws on the books that said you can't do this, you should not take those, and, and all that in different parts of the state. And, and in 1895 was the beginning of what turned into the agency that I work for. It was called the Fisheries Game and Forest Commission originally. A few years later, they turned that around and turned it to the Forest Game and Fisheries Commission. But then that, in 1926, became the Conservation Department. And then in 1970, became the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation. And during that time frame, in the very end of the 1800s, crossing over to 1900, they were trying to strengthen those game laws, make them meaningful, um, have staff available to actually work on it. Uh, but some help with the, from the federal government really reined in what's, you know, one of the biggest drivers was for over-harvest. And so this was because it was 
unregulated market hunting. That was the real problem. It wasn't just each person locally taking what they needed to eat. It was people going out, taking an enormous amount of, of wildlife to just then ship off for someone else to eat, or to ship the furs away, or to ship the feathers away. Um, so this, the Lacey Act essentially made it no longer legal to uh, you know, take and transport and sell things across state lines internationally. So that dramatically reduced the amount of wildlife that were being hunted or trapped uh, for non-consumption, you know, personal consumption purposes. And then another really big law change that still has a lasting effect is in 1937, the federal government passed the Pittman-Robertson Act, also called the Wildlife Restoration Act. That's actually what pays my salary. Uh, it's a 11% tax that got created on, and it applies to firearms, ammunition sales, archery equipment. All that goes into a fund, and it's distributed to different state governments and to different federal agencies to deal with um, bird and mammal conservation and, and hunter education programs. And what that did, starting back then to now, is that allowed staff to be hired to actually monitor wildlife, do surveys, figure out where did they live, how many were there, and that influenced the regulations that would say, okay, these are doing really poorly. We gotta change it, we gotta adjust it, and it's been getting better and better. And, better. and that's part of the reason why we have such great populations of most wildlife, that we have the science to back up our laws and regulations. Next, please. So I'm gonna just, you know, talk about different species individually here so you can see the timeline, timeline of what happened to them. Similar for a lot of them, right? That they were doing okay, they crashed, and then they came back. But, so deer, we know we have plenty of deer now. Uh, back at that time, there were widespread, they were common, but they were very varied in, in their densities and populations. So in just broad, mature forest, there were not gonna be nearly as many deer. It just, the amount of food uh, couldn't support nearly as many deer. But in places where big disturbances had happened and a bunch of young trees were growing, more deer in those areas. And then near human habitation where there were crops and the forest had been opened up, there's gonna be more deer there. So 1880, that's our status. In the early 1800s, the deer numbers actually went up because of that increased settlement, creating the supplemental foods of the crops. Like I just mentioned, more edge, um, making more of the forest have a, a younger composition. Deer actually went up, and there were even you know, issues that we deal with today back then with crop damage. People being like, what are we gonna do? These deer are eating all our stuff. Well, that dramatically changed that the deer then plummeted because the land clearing really picked up steam at that time, so like that, peak 1880, where 25% of the state was forest, way, way too low for deer. You know, deer like to live in agricultural landscapes, but they like a mosaic. So when you have only farms, or as far as the eye can see, you can't support that many deer. Um, and then that market hunting on top of it wiped them out. There were hardly any deer in a lot of New York State um, by the late 1800s. So next, he's actually gonna show us a cool map. Um, it might be hard to see, but so most of New York State is just blank, and you've got these little circles with these hash marks around it. That's where the deer kind of were holding out. But after deer were kind of wiped out from the area, there were still some up in the Adirondacks, in Vermont, and then some in, in Pennsylvania over there. And they slowly started moving their way back into the area from there as that reforestation was occurring, and those game laws were in place to stop people from constantly just harvesting them as they came in. So our area is probably roughly why that number says 1930 is about when deer really started picking up and being in the area regular. Next, beaver. We have lots of beaver now. People in here probably have had to deal with some issues with beaver flooding their stuff, and <laughs> chewing on the tree that they really like. There were even more beaver back 250 400 years ago, and it was such an amazing commodity for the trapping market even before settlement really happened in the area. Um, and so that started driving them down even earlier, and then progressing even more so in the 1800s with better traps, better baits, and things like that, and better markets to ship them off to. Um, so that we found ourselves, what does it say, 1860, they think there were about 50 left in the entire state. And I was reading this old document printed in it was 1895, it was the first annual report from that fish wildlife, or the fisheries 
Forests and Game Commission, and they were talking about how there was one single colony up near Saranac Lake, um, and so they totally said, no more, take a fever. You've got to stop doing this. And still even some illegal takings were from that colony. Uh, but then they started trapping them from there, moving them to different parts of the state where the habitat was suitable. Huge, fast rebound, 15,000 beavers by 1915. So, what is that? 20 year span, and, and they exponentially increased to where we are now. We've got plenty of beaver. It's great. Next, wild turkey. This was always one that blew my mind when I learned about it in school. We had tons of turkey in New York State early on, very reliable food source. You know, it's our whole Thanksgiving kind of story, having turkey on the table. A hundred years went by in New York State where there were no turkeys. It's just mind blowing. So kind of the time frame there, by 1840, they were hardly, hardly around anymore, mostly gone, um, largely habitat problem. Forest destroyed, too, too intensive a farming, and, and they just kept being harvested. So it wasn't until the late 1940s that some of the turkey that were actually holding out in Pennsylvania made their way um, into New York on their own, and then the, the agency tried to actually raise turkey in a farm and release them throughout the state. And they did a bunch of that. Total failure. Didn't work at all. Because they were just too domestic, right? So then they just said, okay, the better choice is take the ones that are naturally moving into New York, trap them, and move them. Huge success. So now we have plenty of turkeys around New York State with a, a lot of effort in you know, the 60s, 70s, and 80s of actually moving and releasing them. Next. So black bear, similar story. Um, you know, late 1800s, very low levels, just in those, you know, probably Adirondacks, Catskills area, down Allegheny area, bounties, actually, against black bears. So it wasn't just that people wanted to consume them, it was that they didn't want them around because they were afraid of them or they were going to, you know, damage their livestock, perhaps. So $10 bounties on black bears in the late 1800s, um, but then, you know, with all those game laws, they finally got protected in the early 1900s. And, and next, please, it'll show us some maps. This is a map from 1950, um, probably from one of our, you know, agency catalogs, talking about where things were. And I think it talks about, like, the best reliable place to find bear for hunting. But there's these dark patches down, like I said, Allegheny, Catskill, um, Adirondacks. That's where, you know, bears were... Consistently, the light gray is just where they might occasionally wander through. And then the next map, please, or next button. This is much more modern. This is uh, showing 1995 to 2007 how the bear range had expanded from there. And you can see right where the gray now blobs up into Ontario County and right over the Bristol Hills. That's when, you know, all of you that probably lived it and were here, you started noticing the bear a whole lot more. So now it's a regular occurrence. You know, we don't even think about it. It's like, of course you saw a bear. They're everywhere. They're, they're roaming all the way up to Lake Ontario into downtown Rochester sometimes. So, next please. <laughs> Bobcat. So again, similar story. Probably was quite widespread early on. You know, a good fur resource. So got trapped pretty heavily and, and you know, utilized in the market that way. At around 1970, they were mostly, again, limited to those hard to access places that weren't as clear, Adirondacks, half skills. Um, and then about 1980, they started increasing because it was more that the forest needed to reach a certain stage before the bobcat were really going to disperse as much. And we don't know as much about bobcat as we want to yet. You know, a lot of our different species, like bear, we've spent a lot of time studying, focusing on bobcats next. So this summer, we're actually going to start a more intensive survey to try and identify where are the bobcat exactly, how many are there, you know, how are they doing. So that's going to be really exciting. Uh, next, please. And similarly, the fisher, which I hope a lot of people in here have heard of and are starting to experience, because that's kind of our, our newest, you know, uh, resident in the Bristol Hills area. That it's absolutely, if you think you saw a fisher, I'm not going to doubt it. You probably did here nowadays. Um, very similarly, you know, disappeared early 1900s just in those areas. It was a great fur resource, so it, it was used for market, market hunting and trapping. Uh, but it probably wasn't very abundant to begin with. You know, just the nature of the animal. It's, um, they're not in groups. They have big territories. So you probably aren't going to see fisher constantly now, but if you still see one, you, you know, it's something special. Um, there was reintroduction efforts for these, so they were 
taken from um, the Adirondacks, moved to the Catskills, and actually moved to Pennsylvania, and the fisher we're seeing here came from Pennsylvania. That's kind of a theme with some of these species that you know, you'd think that they might be coming from within the state, but they're actually coming from the south, moving up into here. Just that's where the better connectivity of forest is. Um, and so these are trail camera photos that were captured from recent studies that DEC has done. So what we're about to embark with Bobcat, we just did for the past several years with Fisher. Um, it's, a lot of people call it a Fisher cat, but it's actually not related to cats. It's a member of the weasel family. So that's pretty cool. Next, please. Elk, have to address them. Uh, we don't have them now, but we had them then. Um, they were pretty easy to harvest, so they didn't really hang around very long. Um, mostly gone from New York by the, 18, the early 1800s. It says so the last one was recorded in the state in 1847. So pretty, pretty early to be gone. Um, hopefully, a lot of you have seen these in the wild. There, there's populations in Pennsylvania and some other eastern states. Out west, they're very widespread. Super cool to see an elk and to hear an elk you know, make their bugle noise. Uh, so they've been reintroduced into Pennsylvania. Uh, odds are they're not going to wander from Pennsylvania to here because from, from what I've read, they pretty intentionally try and contain them and not let them disperse too far. Uh, there actually was a reintroduction attempt in New York State back in the early 1900s. Uh, in the Adirondacks. And, and reading some of those reports the other day, it was just funny to read one report saying, oh, they're doing great, this is awesome, and then you read the report a decade later and they're like, oh no, real bad, total failure. Just They just kept going down. And even if you put more elk in, they kept going down. They were attributing it mostly to disease issues, uh, brain worm and things like that. And so some of the reasons why it's not on our radar to restore elk in New York at the moment, even though there's been feasibility studies that do say there is habitat that can support them, is you know some opposition from people, which is reasonable, would be that you know it's another large animal that they might have to worry about striking with their vehicle. We do that plenty with deer already. You know, bigger one is more of an issue. Damaged crops, deer are already a problem. Elk would just add to that. But one of the biggest region, reasons the agency would be very hesitant to do it is a disease called chronic wasting disease. It could be its own talk. So I mean, there's a lot that I'm glossing over today. So hopefully, if you want to hear more about it in the Q&A, we can do that or having snacks afterwards. But so chronic wasting disease affects all cervids, you know, white-tailed deer, um, caribou, moose, and elk. It's not in New York State right now. We're the only state in the nation to have successfully eradicated the one time it popped out. So it hasn't been in the state for over 15 years. Uh, we do intensive monitoring for it, but it is in plenty of other states. And there was actually, I read, Arkansas reestablished elk, accidentally brought the disease into their state. So all the reason why we don't want to mess with that. So next. Now on to the fun ones, right? We're going to do wolf and then mountain lion. Um, there were plenty of wolves back in the beginning. And they were quickly extirpated. People didn't want them attacking their livestock. They were scary, right? So and there were bounties. People were paid to remove mountain lions. By about 1900, they were gone. And there are still wolves nearby that are doing reasonably well. You know, in western states, they've been constantly expanding, which is awesome, huge success. Western Great Lakes, there's a pretty decent population in northern Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. They're in Ontario, Canada, you know, really focused around Algonquin Provincial Park. So these are places that are not terribly far, but far enough away and blocked by a lot that the odds of them coming from there to here are, are limited. It, it probably isn't going to happen meaningfully anytime soon. But something did happen this past year that maybe you read the news, maybe you didn't. There was a confirmed wolf in New York State, right? Somebody was out coyote hunting. They thought it was a giant coyote. They shot it. They were like, wait a minute. This doesn't seem right. A lot of DNA analysis was run on it and it matched the DNA for the Western Great Lakes population of wolves. So that's pretty cool, but we still don't know how it got here. Um, a lot of the past findings or, or confirmed occurrences of, of wolves or mountain lions in New York State, you know, this says, what did I put up there? This is the third one confirmed in New York in the past 25 years. Those others had clear evidence that they were captive animals. You know, they had marks from being having a collar on them all the time, or their paws were just tore up from living on concrete, things like that. This one looked pretty good. 
So what they're doing right now is a second analysis where they're actually you know, analyzing the chemistry in its body to try and identify what the food source was. Was it eating dog food or beef? Or was it eating natural, you know, whatever, deer and whatever it might eat? And that might help us tease apart whether it, okay, this is a, this is a normal, healthy, wild animal, or okay, this is just a well taken care of pet that got out. We'll find out. Uh, but the next bit of story ties into wolf a little bit to, to show, yeah, you can hit next. What can happen though, things do wander. Mountain lions, same story. Um, one thing I wanted to say about wolf and this, they're both listed as endangered species in New York State under state law. So if they do come and we find them, they are protected. Obviously, if one's chasing you, there's exceptions to human safety is important. Um, and accidents where someone shoots it when they think it was a coyote when there are no wolves around, that could be pretty honest, I suppose. But so, they are protected though, if they come into the state and you see them. Last mountain lion sighting, 1903. There have been some sightings confirmed since then. A lot of them, again, confirmed to be released pets, most likely illegal pets, from those, the evidence I have been showing you, telling you about just the markings on them. <clears throat> but a real one happened, 2011. So the story was that near Lake George, um, actually a DEC officer's wife saw it in the backyard. They talked about it, they went and looked, they found tracks, they found fur. DNA analysis on the fur says this is a mountain lion and it's related to the, the genetics of the South Dakota mountain lion populations. Six months later, a mountain lion gets hit by a car in Connecticut, dies, they run all the tests on it, and obviously it's in front of you, you're holding it, you know it's a mountain lion, but they do the genetics, but this is the same animal that was seen in Lake George. So our governments and you know conservation groups are communicating with other states where they don't have mountain lions to tease through their sightings and observations to be like, well, did you have any mountain lions come through? And there's a trail of evidence that shows that it actually walked from there to here, which is amazing. So, you know, like, and like I don't remember what the other states were, but like in Iowa, oh yeah, we have some fur, let's test it. Oh, it's the same animal. So the story there and the lesson there is that it's not impossible. You may have seen one, you may not have seen one, um, I can't tell you exactly what you have or haven't. <coughs> Odds are they're not going to be seen very much. Um, and we have no reason to think there's a population breeding here. Because the story of that, this one that we confirmed, had a ton of evidence. Besides that, there's no evidence. If there were a breeding population of mountain lions, we'd be seeing all the evidence like this. People would be finding traps. People would be catching it on trail cameras. People would be hitting them with their cars. So. DEC and all of our understanding and research and data shows there's not really mountain lions in your state, but it's not impossible. So, one last bit with the mountain lion, if you hit next, is just an example to show how we respond to when people do report them to us. You know, we take the call, we you know tease through the information. What are they? You know, what did you see? Where was it? Did you get a photo? Um, can you go look for? fur tracks and mud and snow, anything like that. You know, I mean, if, if they've got nothing, you know, we'll try and talk them through, well, hopefully if you see it again, look for this and we'll, we'll respond. But if, if they've got something or they're really, really concerned, we'll, we'll do a site visit, we'll check it out. Um, before we do any of that, if they do send us a video or a, a photo, we're gonna Google the heck out of that. 99% of the time, you find the same photo and it says, British Columbia, mountain lion. Yada, yada. Shot Montana. I don't know why it spreads like wildfire. Somebody says, "Oh, cousin sent this to me," and then I send it this. Oh, my, you know, neighbor's, you know, third cousin. It's the, or people just maliciously throw it in there and just like let's just stir the pot. So this is one where the person was very convinced that this was a mountain lion, and we we're looking at the photo, and you know, a lot of us are like, "Well, I mean, I see the resemblance. It's muscle, it's muscles, and you know, the way it's standing." But all of us are like. Yeah, the size doesn't add up. That's got to be, you know, a giant lane for a mountain lion to look that small. And the corn has to be, you know, <coughs> super, you know, it just doesn't look right. The corn would have to be super tall to be like that next to the road. So what we did was we went there, we have a wooden cutout of a mountain lion, a life-size, average-size mountain lion. We set it up and we take the same photo. <laughs> next. 
<laughs> really shown, so, right? And in the heat of the moment, you don't judge sizes. So it's totally reasonable for mistaken identity to happen. Absolutely. And I constantly want to see one. So I mean, it, it makes sense for people to, you know, their mind to go in a direction. Uh, but this is how we can determine, you know, what is what is likely or what's not. So it's not impossible, but often it's mistaken identity. Uh, next, please. So just uh, one more little bit about wolves and mountain lions. There's been you know, studies with people to decide you know, what is the public sentiment about them and, and if we were to bring them back. There's been feasibility studies to look at, would they even survive, is there enough habitat? Um, and you know, in parts of the state, probably is enough habitat for, for both of these to be sustained. You know, just evidence out west of how they've recovered there too, and they're moving into habitats that are less wild than you would expect. So they probably would fit okay in New York um, if they got here. But so some of the pros, you know, the, the great part about it would be that it would restore the predator-prey dynamic that we lost when we removed these animals. Um, you know, we've got a problem with, with there being more deer on the landscape than there ever were historically. So this could potentially solve some of those problems. Um, and, and some of those issues relate to the forest health and habitats as well, and there being too many deer. So it would be good to bring balance to that. And it might even bring in more tourism because people just like the idea of maybe getting to see one if they came to New York to go camping or something. Um, but the opposition, which is totally legitimate and valid, is worries about <coughs> livestock depredation. You know, sure, it's, you know, it's already bad enough if you have to deal with you know, things getting into your, your, your you know, fawns, or not your fawns, your calves and things like that. And then to add more into the mix, um, impacts to game species. So, Sure, you know, there's a lot of deer in too many places, but some people don't want to see anything drive down the deer numbers because they enjoy hunting and, and having reliable, successful hunts. And then also a fear for attack on humans. Sure, that makes sense, you know. So looking at, at that science of surveys and interviews with people, basically there's some support if they come here on their own, by themselves. We'll let it happen. I mean, they'd be protected under the law anyway, so we kind of have to let it happen. So, there's not much support at all for us to intentionally bring them here. And so DEC's stance on that is, is to let nature take its course with this. And you know, our, our overall mission is to foster a landscape that's healthy, has you know, connectivity between habitats that benefits all wildlife, that needs room to roam. So we'll leave the door open. If they come here and they can and survive, they'll be protected and become one of our you know, New York State species that we can um, you know, be proud of. But um, DEC is not going to be releasing these anytime soon. Um, we have not in the past, no matter what you've heard. Uh, next, please. So just to hit coyote, I think this is my last species I'm going to talk about here. They were not here historically, actually, which is really, really wild. Um, wolves being present here really kept them out. You know, they're all, they're canids, they're territorial. Coyotes, when you look back at, you know, the, the, the fossil records and, and just old, um, bones and all that stuff, they really were limited to the western states, southwest, um, and then started moving their way through after wolves were extirpated from so many places. And they entered New York uh, from the north, actually. They went up into Canada and then came down. Uh, so about in the 1930s or 40s, they were really trickling into the Adirondacks, and by the 80s, they were pretty well throughout the state. Numbers keep increasing, right? We see way more coyote here than we did 30 years ago. Um, they're in New York City now, they're in Long Island. They're very successful and resourceful at finding food and breeding. Uh, but the genetics of them are actually different than the western coyote. Uh, the coyotes that were out west have interbred with um, gray wolves and domestic dogs. So we have a very unique um, eastern coyote species that's a little different. But, but they're around uh, next. Um, so I just wanted to really quickly on this slide touch on a lot of this is a you know, kind of a happy story that even though things were really, really kind of messed up and disrupted and disturbed, a lot of these species bounced right back. But that's not the end of the story. There's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of species that are having hard times. And these are just some bird examples, but species that since surveys targeted towards them started in the mid-60s, they've dropped 85%, you know, 76%. And these are different birds that need either you know, young forests that we don't have a lot of because we have a lot of older forests, or some birds that need older forests but are doing poorly because there's problems with those forests um, and, and you know, bad practices happening or, or you know, insect 
and enforced health issues. And on top of that, there was a study that came out recently that really assessed a whole lot of science over decades. And they determined that since the 70s, there's ongoing you know, lots of really credible data, we've lost 3 billion birds on this planet. It's a huge drop. That's, that's a lot of birds that just disappear. Where'd they go? Uh, so we've got to figure out how to fix that. And it's not one problem. It's a lot of things acting together causing these troubles. So, so my work's never going to end. So I'll be busy till I retire. But then there's also problems with insect decline. Insects are the foundation of the food web. Everything, you know, they eat plants, birds eat the insects, and that keeps things moving, right? So we've lost a lot of insects. Same that there was an article I read and the title was like death by a thousand cuts. Just so many things are disrupting the community of insects. So we're not done. There's still ways that we need to improve our environment and the landscape. But next. So just to kind of continue on that, briefly now, just I'm going to quickly go through what the current threats are, um, the challenges we face now, because you know I like to ask myself, what will this place look like 100 years from now? Because think about the difference 100 years in our past to now, very stark difference. I want to make sure that 100 years from now, it's better, right? And there's some problems that if we do nothing about them, it won't be better. So next, just going to quickly blow through these because they can get a lot of attention elsewhere. But invasive species are a real problem. So generally, we're talking about species not from North America, or at least not from New York State, got brought here on purpose or on accident and they cause trouble because they have no natural enemies, right? They don't have diseases that attack them, they don't have predators that attack them, so they just kind of run rampant and take over. Um, there's insects that kill a lot of trees, pathogens, so like that chestnut blight, um, and, and like I mentioned, the plant, there's regeneration problems. So our forest got hammered 100, 150 years ago, it regrew back because there were young trees to grow. We have problems now that a lot of our forests have no young trees, or the young trees are not the same species. So you might have an oak forest, but everything under it is not an oak. If something killed all those oak trees, what's going to happen? That's a fear of ours. So we're trying to address that. Something that contributes to it, but not entirely. Deer are a part of it. The lack of fire is a part of it. There's lots of things. And then there's still clearing and fragmentation happening, right? A lot of wildlife want a big chunk of forest that's just, you know, a few hundred acres undisrupted. But if you throw a road right in the middle of it, or you put your house right in the middle of it, it starts to get fragmented. So next, please. Just quick, emerald ash borer, probably heard of it. It's affecting the Bristol Hills. You know, a lot of the ash in the Bristol Hills are already on, on their way out. There you know, it's, it's over, or, or close to over. Um, it's throughout the entire state besides three counties now. Very few trees end up surviving. You know, you look at it, and they're all dead, and there might be one there, and it's just like, wow, how did that happen? It's, it's very few, not many. So a lot of what we've got left in western New York is what we call the aftermath forest. And we're really trying to pay attention to it because what's going to replace the ash forest? In some cases, there's baby ash. It's like, well, will they have a future? Um, there are efforts to release predators for this beetle. So maybe we'll get lucky, and that will work, and the ash will replace themselves. But in a lot of cases, these ash forests are in places that were like fields abandoned 30, 40, 50 years ago. A lot of those invasive plants are in there at the same time. So they're going to get in the way from new trees growing. Uh, next, hemlock woolly adelgid. So I mentioned the hemlock. A lot of you know we have some of it in the uh, Bristol Hills on these gullies. There's an insect attack in those. It's been in the state since 85. It's spreading throughout the state. So it's, it's pretty well. Um, you know, present here in this part of the Finger Lakes. Some places still low numbers, some places already hemlocks are dying. It takes a few years, um, sometimes longer, but that's that's a worry for ours. If you hit next, please. And, and this is part of the reason why this, this photo shows all hemlocks and there's a stream running right through, right? These gullies. There's nothing else growing there, so what might replace them? Um, but if they die, are we going to have erosion problems? Uh, is the shade being gone on the waterway going to be a problem for the aquatic life? Trout? There's a lot to worry about. So again, Cornell, great scientists doing research trying to get predators on the landscape to control these as well. Um, we don't know the future. Fingers crossed. We'll see. Next. Oak wilt is the last example I'm going to say, so don't worry about it. Uh, not a ton more. Um, this one is very local, so it, it matters to point out. It's been found in Town Canandaigua, um, 
and, and Bristol up near State Land, Stid Hill, WMA Wildlife Management Area. It's been found there. It's in Middlesex. You know, it all started back in 2018, and we hoped that it wouldn't keep popping up, and it's kept popping up. So it's not widespread yet, but it's, it's nearby, and, and it can kill a red oak pretty quick in a matter of weeks to a few months. Um, white oaks, it'll kill slower, you know, one to three years or so, but they still die. Uh, and that's a problem. And, and at least something that you could do to try and reduce that risk is if you have oaks in your yard and you want to prune, prune some lower limbs, wait until fall or winter to do that. Because if you do it in the spring and summer, that wound, the smell of the sap, attracts certain beetles that also like to feed on the fruit of the fungus. Oak wilt is a fungus. And so they might spread it, the spores, into that wound. So that beetle will bring it to your new tree. So if you wait till winter, when it's too cold for insects, you should be okay. Same with logging of oak forest. Try to do that when it's colder out to avoid those wounds. Uh, next. Overabundant deer, I've already talked about it. The problem is, is that in some places, not everywhere, there's so many deer that they're eating everything in the understory of the forest. Um, this photo shows, you know, we've got trees, we've got nothing underneath. So if something happened to kill those trees, what's going to grow? Whatever the deer don't want to eat, right? And that could be invasive plants, bad things like that. So a way that you can address that, the next button is, consider hunt, allowing hunting on your property. If you own private property, you know, say you own 30 acres and you don't hunt it, think about letting someone in there. It will be better for your property. It will make your forest more healthy to have deer removed from it, to have a lower population. We don't need to get rid of deer. We just need there to be a little less. Um, and this sticker up there, well, it's a sticker. It says, ask. You call us. We can send you a bunch of these stickers. You can throw them on your posted signs so that anybody that you know is near your boundary line be like, this, hunt, this, this um, landowner would be okay with it if I you know, talked to them, had a conversation, asked for their permission. Um, and there is liability protection in New York State. If, if someone doesn't pay you to come onto your land, and, they, and so they get hurt, and it's all a free transaction, You've got liability protection. New York State has a fund that will help you um, deal with that. So don't worry about getting sued unless you know someone's paying you to get on your property. Next. Just uh, quickly point out some of these invasive plants. Honeysuckle on the upper left. Hopefully, you know, some of you have heard about all these and it's old news, but swallowwort's a, a problem. Buckthorn is a really nasty problem, and then autumn olive. We've got plenty of this in the Bristol Hills. Swallowwort probably is the newest one that's moving into the Bristol Hills. Um, keep an eye out for these. They're, they're a problem. And the next slide is going to illustrate the, the issue a little bit more. Hit next, please. So this forest, it's be hard for you to see, but I took this photo just the other day on the side of the road because I thought it was a good example. There's a forest here of pretty sparse trees. You know, they're all probably like 10 inches in diameter. They're not that big. It's walnuts and it's ash. And what you can't see as well on the understory is it's just a solid tan mat. It's all honeysuckle, 100% honeysuckle. Half of that was ash, right? Those ash are dying or dead. They probably all started growing at the same time. That field was probably abandoned, you know what, 30 years ago or something. And at that time, the honeysuckle next to the ash and walnut still let some trees make it through. But those ash dying now and the honeysuckle already being well entrenched, it's going to be a hard time for any trees to grow up there. So this is a real problem to try and correct. Um, next, so just some more reasons to dislike invasive plants. So they outcompete natives, like I just mentioned. Next, there's been a lot of studies showing that since they don't have those natural enemies, they don't have the predators, the insects that want to eat their leaves to make them grow slower. They don't support those insects, so that wildlife doesn't have insects to eat. So in an area like this, you're going to be able to support a lot less birds and mammals because they just don't have the bugs to eat. Next. And same with the berries, you know, buckthorn's loaded with blackberries, uh, honeysuckle tons of red berries, but there's been a lot of studies showing the actual nutrition of those is garbage. They are, you know, the fast food of the natural world. High sugar, very low, you know, calorie or nutrition. So, and then you directly compare them next to native plants, which I'm going to make some suggestions for that you might want to plant full of fat, great for water. So, next. So this is what we want our forest to look like you know, over the next hundred years. We want to make sure that they, they remain healthy, try and, you know, prevent these, these outbreaks of, of invasive um, pests and pathogens, deal with the invasive plants that might outcompete native plants, and allow our forest to become healthy and, and diverse with these different layers, young trees, middle-aged trees, 
big old trees here and there, you know, a diversity on the landscape of some swaths of younger forests, some older forests, so that all the needs of wildlife are up. But that builds in resiliency. So like that photo I showed of that, you know, red pine plantation. One species dominates the canopy. Something comes and kills that, it's game over. It's not resilient. If you have a diverse forest, if you've got oaks, hickories, maples, um, you know, hornbeam, all sorts of things all at the same time, Something tries to attack one of them, there's other ones to fill the gap. So diversity is really good for uh, having in a, in a forest. Make them connected. You know, if you've got a hedgerow, keep it. Hedgerows are awesome. They connect different chunks of habitat, things can move around. If you've got a, a way that you can increase the buffer on, you know, a ditch or a stream that goes through your property so it can connect to pockets of a forest, awesome. And then that unfragmented. If you've got the choice to build your house outside of the forest instead of in the forest, it's the better wildlife choice to keep it out of the woods, even though you probably really want to live in the woods, because I know I do, but I, I, I would have a hard time popping a hole in the middle of the forest and not feeling bad about it. Next. So, yeah, real quick, some of the things that you could do to make sure the habitat, wildlife of Bristol Hills is good 100 years from now. Next. So manage or restore your forest if you own forests. So I already talked about invasives, don't worry about that. Create new habitat. You know, if you find yourself mowing five acres and you're getting sick of it, let some of it go. It would be great for wildlife. Plant some shrubs, some trees, or some, some wildflowers. It will really be awesome, um, and, and it won't do anything bad. Um, like I said, avoid fragmentation if you can, if you have forest already. A big one is this, do not high grade. So if you own some forest, and you intend to do some logging, which is totally reasonable, can be totally great with, with forest health, and, and and, and forest habitats. Don't do this practice called hybrid. So what that is, is basically just having a logger come and taking out all the trees that are worth money and leaving everything else behind. Because then your future forest is made up the, of the losers. You know, you think about that forest all started at once. It was a race to the top. All the winners made it to the top. The best genetics made it to the top. The best, you know, species that you're looking at made it to the top. So it might be all oak that they're taking. And all the stuff left behind is like, you know, Diseased beach, or yeah, there's no problem. Our beech trees are dying, but I won't go into that too much. But uh, uh, or or you know stunted maple trees that will never grow to you know a merchantable timber size. So what you really want to do if you're going to log your property is to work with a forester, an actual trained forester. That they're not just about you know the logging side of things. They absolutely are very knowledgeable about the value of, of board feet and timber, but they also understand how to grow trees and how to make sure that you will have trees worth something in the future and have habitat value. So that's why I have here work with a DEC cooperating forester. So these are private foresters, not DEC staff, but they've been you know, approved by DEC saying, yeah, they know how to do it right and they will do it right. So they'll charge you a fee to you know, organize and administer your sale that you might have on your property, but they are so knowledgeable and so smart, you're going to end up ahead. You're going to make more money in the short term and the long term versus just hiring a logger to come in and take whatever they choose is worth the most money. So avoid high grading and work with a forester. And then if you think anything about forests is super cool, I have to highlight uh, NIFOA, the New York Forest Owners Association. Super cool group. If you own even just a few acres of forest, look them up. Think about becoming a member. They often have um, you know, workshops to learn how to do things and just to toss around ideas. On YouTube, there's really cool webinars on Forest Connect. Uh, it's a Cornell Cooperative Extension, all sorts of really cool info about forests. And then if you see invasive plants, report them to a thing called IMAP Invasives. Just Google that, IMAP Invasives, and it's a way for you to take a photo, throw it in the computer and say, I saw this here. And that helps feed the data so we know where things are and can decide what to do. And next, Almost done. So just some cool native plants I want to point out. Service berry, also called Juneberry, awesome. Gray dogwood, that will also often start growing into an old field if you stop mowing. That might pop up. Spice bush, choke cherry, great native shrubs that, that I love, wildlife love. If you want to get some things to plant right now, contact you know Ontario County Soil and Water Conservation District. They're doing their spring seedling sale right now. You can order them and they'll you know be available for pickup sometime in April usually. And the, they'll be little tiny things, bare root, and you just you know, shovel them in the ground and they'll have some good stuff. And they're pretty affordable when you buy them that way. Or DEC has a nursery called the 
our Saratoga nursery, and you can buy pretty cheap. You can get like 250 little trees for not very much money, like 40 bucks, and um, you know, you just they'll be delivered to some place nearby, or they can be delivered to your house, but that costs a little more if you don't want to do that. It can be some other location. So next. Uh, we talked about controlling invasives. Just do whatever you can. You can kill them with herbicide. You can just pull them out. These are pods off swallow work in the top middle. Honeysuckle can pull out really easy when the ground is soft, springtime. Um, or just clean your shoes off before you go for a hike somewhere or after you hike. Clean off your shoes so you're not moving seeds from one place to another. Um, and then this is just showing an insecticide treatment that we're, uh, we've been doing on some of our hemlock trees. That I mean, if you've got hemlocks and you want to save them, it's, it's not cheap. We're trying to make the world er, it easier with having some sort of cost funding for private landowners. We'll get there. But there's ways to save your hemlocks. Um, next. So DEC also has private land foresters. If you do own some land, you know, 10, 30, 200 acres, they can write you a stewardship plan. You know, if you say, I don't know anything, but I want to do what's right, they'll come out, they'll tell you what you got, what's good about it, what's bad about it, and recommend what you should do over the next 10 years to make it better. So, just a phone number there. This guy, Bryce, he can put you in the right direction to the right forester that can come and walk your land with you and talk about it. It's really cool. And then if you own enough land, there might be ways to get some tax breaks if you manage it in, in a sustainable, good way. So, next. And then you might be able to get some money for it. That's the hardest part about helping your property is it can cost money to control invasives or to do forest management that doesn't involve selling. You know, it's not worth anything, but you still need to get it cut because that'll make other trees grow better. You can get money from the federal government to get some of this done. Uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, that's the main thing. Call NRCS, it's with the US Department of Agriculture. And just have a, ch a conversation with, with one of their staff and they'll let you know if there's a program that matches with your property and hopefully move you forward there. I got money from them to get a contractor out on my private land to get some really good work done. So I was really happy about that. And DEC has a program called Regenerate New York. And it's all about trying to address the problem that we don't have enough little trees or the right little trees growing to replace the bigger trees that we know we're gonna lose at some point. Um, so they're trying to address that by helping private landowners pay the tab that's gonna be needed to you know, fence out the deer or to kill the invasive plants or to do that you know, non-commercial cut that's not worth anything but will help your forest grow the right trees, they're about to start the next round of it. We would submit an application and hopefully get you know, some good funding. So next, I think that's it. Okay, I've got nothing else to say except to answer all the questions that you hopefully have. So I just wanna say thank you, this was great. Unbelievable amount of people here. I hope I didn't talk too long, I apologize to the viewer. <laughs> Five minutes or so of open yeah. Q&A. After that, we have the uh, director of the Bristol Library is here, and she's going to talk about how you can do research on the topics that you just heard about. You're also doing, uh, she can get library cards, so she's a one-stop shop here. I'll be brief. She'll be brief. And then, uh, so we'll take about, and then after, we can go into the back room here. There'll be some uh, munchies uh, and, and coffee. Uh, T-shirts for sale if you want to help support us and be fashionable. And um, our, do our donation box. Has somebody got the sign-up sheet? Is that going around on the clipboards in the back? Okay. So uh, I, want to, I want the first question. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Can I have two? Mm -hmm. Be quick. First one's a yes or no. Has the DEC ever got a report a Bigfoot sighting? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. We've got reports, but nothing that we can well, just validate. So yeah. people have reported us. Sure. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it's, 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 <laughs> and the second one, uh, talk about your uh, excuse me, native bird population decline. Yeah. Is it okay to shoot feral cats? No. Okay, that's that's too hard of a question to answer clearly today, but I, I, what I will tell you is that yes, feral cats are a problem for birds. Um, they they kill birds more than they eat the birds, right? So that's the problem. Um, that's more of a problem for birds that are going to be in that suburban or, or near a house, so it doesn't affect all birds. Uh, but it's it's up there in the, you know, they kill millions and millions of birds a year. Whether you can shoot a feral cat is beyond the environmental conservation law, which is what I work under. And so 
it's hard to give a clear answer there because it, it has to deal with you know domestic animals, and that might be more about uh, the New York State's Ag and Markets Agency that might regulate a domestic animal. Um, so I would say, don't will and nilly shoot your neighbor's cat. Um, <laughs> but I can understand why you would want to. There's probably scenarios where it would be allowable. Um, but yeah, I don't have a great answer to say yes or no for that one, except that they are a problem. And, and our agency doesn't probably have a, as good of an answer as it should to make it cleaner and easier for people. Yes? Have coyotes grown in size since they've been um, increasing their um, region? I, 20 years ago, I saw scrawny coyotes. Now I'm seeing bigger coyotes. That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. So I, I will start it by saying I'm not a fur bearer specialist. So we do have someone who probably can answer that question for you and, and has heard that and studied it before. Um, and I'd be happy to direct them, you to them, that I've got cards that I could give out and you could shoot me an email and I'll give you the right contact. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's possible that it could be just with today's food resources and, and I, it's hard to say. So maybe. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Um, are you going to share your PowerPoint with the Historical Society or somewhere that we can see these same, especially the ones with all the data, the phone yeah. numbers? Sure, I could, I could do that. That shouldn't be a problem at all. So I could just email it to you. Um, right, with Mark, or Mark, or Mark, yeah. And then, yeah, you can disperse it to whoever you want. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, um, if a cat, a wild cat, a cat, or a um, mountain lion was coming up this way, wouldn't it, why would it go so far away and not have any um, mate to breed with when you said there might be a one stray one coming through? Right. Is it looking for a mate or like, I'm just wondering why you would, why only one would come. If you saw one, yeah. wouldn't you assume there might be more than one? Because right. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question about, so the dispersal of a, of a mountain lion or a wolf, why might a, a lone one be wandering? And, and so, it's mainly that, yeah, young males are just out trying to establish their own territory, and that's usually what they do before they try to find, you know, a mate that would be, you know, passing through. Um, so it's just the nature of a lot of these species that, that they, 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 they roam and then make a family, and then they don't usually stay with that family or travel with that family. You know, wolf packs are different, um, but a mountain lion is a very solitary creature. Um, and it's, it actually brings me back to another bit that I didn't mention here. Canada lynx was a great example that, that we used to have Canada lynx in New York State, mostly just further north because they like it to be more cold. And some effort was, was done to release Canada lynx into the Adirondacks to reintroduce them. Uh, I think they released about 50 and it was a complete failure because each one just walked away as fast as they, or as far as they could because there was no territorial boundaries for them to be like, okay, I've reached the, ed the edge of this other one, here's where I'm gonna make mine. So sometimes that's probably part of it, is that they start walking mm -hmm. into these places that don't already have mountain lions, they're like, well, I'm gonna keep walking because I haven't hit a wall yet. So that, that's probably part of it too. And did yeah. they scent along the way to try to attract a female or? Um... Yeah, yeah, so that it could be that in time, if numbers increase in other places out west, more might disperse to the point that it could reach a level. Um, it's hard to say. Possible. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, is striped maple a sustainable tree, or is it, a, per se, a weed? Right. So, in, in certain circumstances, it could be considered a weed. So, striped maple was his question. And so, in, in this part of New York State, we have uh, a few maples. We got sugar maple, red maple, um, silver maple. And those are really tree trees, you know, pretty big. Uh, we have a little bit of mountain maple, but very, you know, secluded parts of like gullies around here, it's more other parts of New York State. But we have plenty of striped maple in some places, and a lot of times that grows under the forest, you know, this big around at most, usually this big, this tall. And that's one of those issues that if you had an oak forest with no young oaks and a ton of striped maple, and you had someone come in and just take all your oak, those striped maples could get in the way. So it depends on your objectives, whether you want to do anything about it, because it's a native plant that supports great parts of, of you know, our ecosystem that there's, you know, insects living on that. You know, moths and butterflies using it as a host plant, a food plant, 
and then contributing to the rest of the food web. Um, so there's no shame in having striped maple, but if you want to regenerate your forest and, and do a cut to grow something, yeah, cut it out of the way. You can use herbicide on it. There's times where it makes sense, but overall, it's not something to hate just because it's there. It's if you have too many and you have a goal to try to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you first. Okay. Uh, two questions. Do you know of any website where you can send photos, prints of animals to where they can identify what they are? And then secondly, can you touch base on the koi wolf, which is the wolf coyote hybrid, and whether any have been found in the area? Okay, so first, I mean, if you have any photos of something that is an animal, you know, a, a wildlife, bird, mammal, whatever, you can send it to us at DEC. Um, we have a, a regional wildlife just general email that you could send it to. Um, I don't want to get it wrong, so let me give you my card. I'll be here for coffee afterwards, and then that would be a good starting point. I'll get you the right one. If you're looking for identifying insects, DEC does have a, we call it our forest diagnostic lab. And they'll take photos of any insects and try to identify them for people. And then send, because there's other things you can send them to where, you know, they may make you pay for an ID. And that can be probably expedited and, and quick, but we, we have a service that's free that they'll do their best they can. The koi dog thing, again, I'm not a fur bearer expert, so it's hard for me to say, but the last I recall reading that story is that it's not really a thing. They, they, they can breed with with domestic dogs, but they I, don't. I was referring to koi wolf. Oh, koi wolf. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, I think that the, the wolf genetics that we already have in our coyotes is really embedded and it has been there a long time. And so that could show um, in some coyotes being bigger than others. Maybe that's part of, of why some are bigger. But, um, you know, really what we have, it's a coyote, no matter what it is when you see it in New York State. You know, um, we don't have wolves for them to be doing that crossbreeding with to have a direct coyote wolf hybrid here but yeah last I heard uh, I think our stance was that you know it's it's more of a just a hyped up worry that it's not actually a problem that coyotes that we have are just coyotes and some of them are big yeah yes I don't have a question for you but kind of an announcement <clears throat> I'm with the Canada Lake Watershed Association and uh, we're all like-minded here uh, in this group so just as an announcement we have a website that's very, very good, Kennedy Lake Watershed, ASSOC, and all kinds of information can be obtained from that. We're currently worried about spotted lanternfly, which is an economic disaster in the making. They love to kill grapevines, and what would our economy do without grapevines? So that's a real serious problem, not so much an ecological, but a real uh, economic one. Oh. Secondly, we have an HWA program coming up early in March. And uh, go to our website to get the time and place for that. But if you're interested in HWA <coughs> preservation, uh, or destruction, not preserving the HWA, but those insects uh, uh, are possibly ready to uh, destroy our, our healthy gullies, which lead into all of our rates. And uh, if those gullies go, we have real problems. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great info. Yes, sir. Can you comment on that? That's a really good question, and I almost put a slide in here to acknowledge some of the other, you know, what I was going to call the winners of, of wildlife that benefited from the change in forest, the increase in forest, and the maturing of forest. And that was one where, so you saw that I had those date, those numbers there that some of these species were down 75%. Down for, I think pileated woodpecker and barred owl were for, for New York State data up like 80%. Or, or, or I, don't know, I think one of them was up like 300%. Like it was wild. So you're absolutely right. That, that's one that's responded similar to these other species. And, and yeah, they like big old running logs. So the more of those that we have or, or standing dead trees, the better it is for them. Yep. Good observation. Yeah. Yes. Um, are, are you still, or can you tell me what the percentage of uh, um, pheasants are now compared to before? So, okay, that's a good question. So pheasants at that beginning time, like 1780, at least in this part of the state, was zero. So they're not a native species. We, we brought um, you know, Asian pheasants here for you know, recreational hunting pursuits. And during that time frame of, of 
forest being wiped out and us having tons of farmland, the pheasants loved that. So we had tons of pheasants, and as those farms started to slowly be abandoned, you know, they still liked that kind of scrubby, you know, young growth. Um, and, and it wasn't up until maybe the middle of this uh, 1950s, 60s or so that the, that kind of started to turn. And, and it's more related to issues with, with agriculture becoming so intensive that they don't have adequate, you know, um, you know pasture, hay fields to survive in. And, and on our properties, on, on conservation land, grassland is, you know, really a small component, uh, especially in comparison to the whole landscape of millions of acres. So it, it's a drop in the bucket. So that's what we're seeing as the biggest issue, because we, we raise pheasants as an agency, and we release, release them on different places for um, the hunting re resource. But recently, I think they've, they've you know, we've done a long-term study in Livingston County, looking at some of the wild pheasants that are still self-sustaining, that actually can breed, have eggs, and be successful, and, and it's just determined that what they have there and how they're still declining, even there where there's lots of you know hay and pasture, um, the feasibility of having a reproductive population of them in New York State under the current circumstances with very intensive you know um, uh, corporate agriculture on the landscape it just won't sustain them. So we'll, we'll continue with the program of releasing them, um, you know, for that recreation, but to bring them back as a wild species is a battle did, we don't did the, win. Do the coyotes have anything to do with uh, their reliability? or? Right, so so there's there's been studies to look at the effect of predators on a lot of our game species, on, on turkey reproduction, on fawns, um, and, and what it basically determined was other environmental factors have more effect than predators, you know, like a, a bad spring that allows, you know, a lot of nest failure. Um, <coughs> West Nile virus is actually a big problem right now for a lot of these birds, particularly rough grouse. West Nile virus is killing that. So, um, sure, coyotes are eating some of them occasionally, um, but it's, they're not the driving force. You know, there's been a lot of diet studies, too, looking at what coyotes are actually eating. And like fishers, looking at what fishers are eating, because that's another concern. Fishers eating our turkeys, and and it's more small mammals. You know, they're eating mice, voles, bunnies more than they're eating anything else. Um, and luckily, bunnies reproduce so fast that, that doesn't have as much of an effect on them. So thank you. And like Polly, yeah, uh, we've been going for a while. If yep. we could, anybody has more questions, you're going to be around. Yeah, I'll stick around a bit. Yep. Our tax dollars are still paying for him. <laughs> 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 but I wanted to give. Uh, Heidi, the uh, director, her moment in the, the spotlight here. And then, yeah. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you. Thank you for coming out. I'm Heidi Hexley, the new director at the Soul Library. Um, I just wanted to show you that I have this traveling library set up with some books that you can read more about what was spoken about today. And uh, if you don't know, Bristol Library is on County Road 32 across from Levi Corser Park. Our building used to be the blacksmith slash post office for the town of Bristol, which I think is very cool. And we have the old schoolhouse bell from 1864. Is that true? <laughs> Something around there. Um, so yeah, I'll be brief. You can reach me at Bristol Library Director at owl.org. We have a lot of books and movies and audiobooks and programs. I have to run to uh, host a writing workshop. We have a Weaver's Guild. We have knitting. We have story time. We have stuff for all ages. And it's a very cool place. Come say hi. And I would love to speak to some of you while we eat cookies and drink coffee. <laughs>